Good morning. Welcome to peace. Welcome to your Lord's house today. Today we gather around God's word, and as we do, we're going to take a look at the foundation of our faith. And what is our faith built? And we are going to see from God's word today that when we build on Christ and what he does and what he has given us in his word, uh, then we have a firm foundation that cannot be shaken. So God bless us as we gather in that theme today. Today, everything for our service is in the service folder. Uh, if you did not receive one, there are some in the basket in the back. The service will also be on the screen. You can follow along that way as well. Today, we'll begin with uh, gathering under the blessing of God's word. We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. I invite you to stand. Oh, how I love your word. I long to meditate on it all day long. Your words make me wise. For they are ever with me. I have more insight than all my teachers. For I meditate on your statutes. How sweet are your words to my taste. Sweeter than honey. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Yet so often we have despised God's word and failed to gladly hear and learn it. For this and for all our sins, we bow before God and humbly ask for his forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins. And trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God gave his word so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. The scriptures testify about Jesus, who lived a perfect life for you, died on the cross to pay for all your sins, and rose again to assure you of your salvation. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.
Let us pray. Almighty and merciful God, you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to seek and to save the lost. Graciously open our ears and our hearts to hear his call and follow him by faith, that we may feast with him forever in his kingdom. Through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. We now focus our hearts and our minds on the lessons from God's Word. Our first lesson today is taken from Deuteronomy chapter 11. The context of this is, is in the history of God's people. They had been delivered from slavery in Egypt. They had wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. They're, they're going to enter the promised land. And you think, this is it. Everything is, is coming to fruition. And it was. God was keeping his promise. But what, what's so easy to, ha- what's easy to happen when... when when you're at that point in your life, to forget everything, right? So Deuteronomy is reminding them of all that God has said. And the encouragement here is to keep God's words, his promises, especially the promise of salvation through his son, as the foundation of your faith and the foundation of your life. It's easy to go through the motions. It's easy to to look good on the outside but to really make these words and promises of God the foundation of your life. It's also the encouragement for us today. Fix these words of mine in your hearts and minds. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them to your foreheads. Teach them to your children. Talking about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates so that your days and the days of your children may be many in the land the Lord swore to give your ancestors, as many as the days that the heavens are above the earth. See, I'm setting before you today a blessing and a curse. The blessing if you obey the commands of the Lord your God that I am giving you today. The curse if you disobey the commands of the Lord your God and turn from the way that I command you today by following other gods which you have not known. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Children, I invite you to come forward for the children's message. Good morning. Thanks for coming up here. Thanks for being in God's house today. Jesus has a special message for you today. I have uh, I have a couple of of items up here, and what I want you to do is I want you to think of building. Do you ever build things? Maybe build things with Legos. Maybe you you build things with just boxes you get around the house. You ever build a fort or like homes for your stuffed animals or anything like that? Yeah, we we do these building things, right? It's fun to build, and it's fun to make the house look really nice, but you know what's important? What's important is what is on the bottom of what you build. I want to show you that, okay? So I have two materials here. This first one, what is this? Yeah, this is sand. Sand, and I also have a rock, right? Right? So which material do you think is better to to build your Definitely the rock. No, no question. Who agrees? You all agree? Why would you want to build on a rock instead of the sand? It's solid, right? What would happen if you build your house on this sand? Do you see how uneven it is? Right? Okay. It would it maybe tip, right? But let's say I leveled it out, and it's nice and level, and I build there. What happens if, like, it, it rains, or there's a big storm, and or a big wind, what, what happens to the sand? It's wet, you get, it gets muddy, right? But it also, it shifts, right? And it would sink into that sand, wouldn't it? Because it, it moves so much. But look, you look at the rock, 
It's solid. It wouldn't, I know this is a tippy rock, so maybe that's a bad example. But if it was solid like this, it doesn't move. You could pour water on it, you could blow on it, and it doesn't move, right? So, Jesus uses that same picture today. And he's not building a house. You know what he's building? He's building your faith, your trust in Jesus, your love for him. And just like, just like with building a house, it's easy uh, to build on things that move and, and get washed away. Here's an example. Um, what, is, what is Jesus all about to us, right? What, sometimes we think it's all about me making my promises to Jesus, right? Look at Jesus. I promise to do this. Uh, I promise to do that. And look how good I am. Do, are you like me? Have you, are all of your promises, do you keep all of your promises? I, I try really hard, right? But sometimes I, I don't keep my promises. I say, I'm going to do this, and then something else happens, and I, and I don't do it. Do you think that happens with our promises to love Jesus? It does, right? And so imagine if that was what heaven was all about, that Jesus made you keep 100% of your promises, and if you didn't, you get no heaven. That would be scary, wouldn't it? My promises, your promises, are like the sand. The sand that is, it moves around a lot, right? But Jesus says that heaven isn't based on my promises. Do you know what it's based on? Why do you get to go to heaven? It's because of Jesus' promises. Jesus promises that he loves you, and he keeps it. Jesus promises that he died on the cross and he took all of our sins away. Even when I don't do what I say I'm going to do. He took it all away. And he rose from the dead so you can have heaven. And Jesus' promises are like the rock. They don't move ever. So can you be sure about heaven? Yes. Because it's not on my promises. It's not in the sand of my promises. You know you can go to heaven because it's on the rock of Jesus and his promises. Amen. Will you pray with me? Dear Jesus, thank you for being the rock of my salvation, the rock of my faith. Help me to always trust in you and your promises, and then help those promises to, to live in me so that I can live for you. Amen. Thank you so much for coming up here. You may go back to your seats. continue with our gospel acclamation. The gospel acclamation is a, is a verse from scripture that really helps us focus on the theme of the day and really introduce the message of Jesus' words in the gospel. Alleluia, alleluia. Your word is a lamp for my feet and a light for my path. Your statutes are the joy of my heart. Alleluia. The gospel records the words and the works of our Savior, and so I invite you to stand in respect of those words. The gospel will serve as the basis for our message today, so we'll talk about it further in just a few minutes. The gospel according to Matthew chapter 7. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit you will recognize them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down. The streams rose the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall, 
because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. You may be seated for our next song. Grace and mercy and peace. Those are your blessings from God. They come to you through our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. God's word for our focus is the gospel we just heard. I'm really going to focus on the, the last section where Jesus talks about the wise and the foolish builders. Uh, talking about the foundation of our faith. I think you know that I'm not a realtor. Okay? But... I'm going to try to be one today. Okay, I'm going to just want to see if you would be interested in a couple of properties that I have for you. So I'm going to show you a couple of properties. Let's see what your interest level is. Here's the first one. It's a nice home. I think it's a good, good family home. You can tell by the, by the trees out front. It's in a warm area. Just curious if anybody would, if you're looking, be interested in that home. Perhaps, right? Maybe there's one more thing I should tell you about this home. It is built uh, on a sinkhole. <laughs> this is a home in Florida that just all of a sudden, that's kind of what we talked about, right kids, with the sand? So maybe I need to tell you about a different house. Here's a nice, beautiful house, uh, really a, a showpiece of a house. All your friends would be jealous if you had this house. I think if you could afford it, you'd be interested in this house, wouldn't you? Um, just one thing I probably should tell you about that, too. It's built on a cliff where there's landslides. Would you be interested? Obviously not, right? So you can see why I'm not a realtor. I'm not really good at this. Nobody would be interested in buying these kinds of houses, and there's one reason for that. When it comes to real estate, there's one overriding principle, and you know what it is. You've heard it. Location, location, location. It doesn't matter if your house looks amazing. It doesn't matter 
how nice it looks. It doesn't matter how many amenities there are or how jealous people are of how your house looks. If it's not built in the right spot, it's worthless. And that's especially true if it's built in a mudslide area or a sinkhole, right? The reason I bring this up is like what I talked about with the children's message. As we look at Jesus' words in Matthew, he has a very similar picture for us when it comes to our faith, when it comes to our relationship with God. It's the same principle as real estate. When it comes to your faith, it's all about location, location, location. Your faith can look really good. People can talk about how good you look and, and you can brag about the good things that you do and look at what a, a great Christian I am, but if it's not built in the right location, it's as worthless as a house on a sinkhole. And so the question I want us to think about as we meditate on these words in Matthew, these words of Jesus, is this. On what is my faith built? As I studied these words this week, I, I just thought it was really good timing. I, I think it's a good time for us to look at these words of Jesus. And here's what I mean by that. I think there's a real danger for us as followers of Jesus right now. And the danger comes because when we look at the world around us, when we look at, at the future, we, we can tell, we, we know things are shifting very rapidly. Perception of, of us, of, of Scripture, it's, it's, it's really shifting and changing in the world. We look ahead at the future and there's a lot of uncertainty. There's a lot of fear. There's a lot of dread maybe. And when that happens, I think the real temptation for us is to look out there at all these things and start really pointing the fingers to say, ah, there is the problem. There is the evil. There, those are the things, those are the people. That's what needs to change, right? And I'm not doubting that. There, there's probably a lot of truth to that. But what's interesting is that when we're tempted to do that, what Jesus does in Matthew 7 is he comes to us and he wants us to start in a different place. To not be pointing and looking out there, but instead be pointing here. Evaluating where we are, where our own faith, where our own hearts are at. I think that we see that very clearly. I want to back that teaching up. I think we see that clearly here in Matthew. Because, again, context is everything. These words come at the very end of Jesus' longest recorded sermon in the Bible, his most famous sermon in the Bible, the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount. And, and he tells us very clearly who he's talking to at the beginning of his sermon. He's not talking to or about corrupt leaders. He's not talking to or about... Um, vile uh, offenders and violent people. He, he's not talking to or about people around them in the world who are doing these evil things. He is teaching his disciples. He's teaching followers of him. He's teaching, teaching Christians. He's teaching you and he's teaching me. And he has a word of warning and a word of encouragement for us. And I know that sounds a little strange, and, and maybe we're thinking, well, that's unfair. We're, we're the followers of Jesus. What about all the stuff that's going on? But think of it like this. To use Jesus' metaphor of building houses, Jesus doesn't want us to look at the world around us and see the houses that are sinking and go, wow, that's bad. Instead, he wants us to make sure that our own houses are not also sinking. That makes sense? That's why Jesus says these words. He, he wants us to evaluate our hearts, and he wants us to evaluate our lives by looking at, at two things. He speaks specifically about the way we talk and the things we hear. So I want to point that out by taking a look at some of the words here. The talking first. He says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, didn't we not, did we not prophesy in your name? 
in your name drive out demons, in your name perform many miracles? And I'll tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Again, that, that really catches us because who's he talking to? Disciples. These are people who would go out and speak in Jesus' name. These are the people who called Jesus Lord, and yet there's a warning. It's not just about what you, the, the sounds that come out of your mouth. It's not just the way that you want people to perceive you. It's deeper than that. We're going to talk about that in a second. And the second thing he talks about is how we hear things. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. Again, interesting in the context these people are sitting at Jesus' feet. They are actually listening to his words, and yet there's a warning for the very ones who listen to Jesus' words. It's not just about being there. It's not just about knowing some facts. It's deeper than that. I think what this shows is just how well Jesus knows us and how much he loves us. Jesus knows the real dangers for his followers. He knows what the natural inclinations of our hearts are. And what is that? The natural inclination is to really be concerned about the outside, about appearances, how people perceive us, and thereby, therefore, how God perceives us as well. How does it look? How does it sound on the outside? If everything looks all right, I must be all right. And I think that's fueled by the prevalent religious culture around us, too. Do you, do you notice this, too? It feels like there's a, I don't call it a movement, <laughs> but kind of a shift going on even in religious culture. There's strange things going on. It, it feels like the, the emphasis, even among Christians, is just love. Just say the word love and everything's good. It's, there's a weird emphasis on if you can become more like Christ by actually removing God's word from your life. Just, just look like Christ. Again, outward appearances. And, and what this is, it's like paying attention to the outside of your house, maybe putting a new coat of paint on, maybe putting an addition on, and paying zero attention to the foundation on which it's built. In other words, just to put this into practice in our own lives, I feel like sometimes it's easy for us Christians, it's the inclination of us Christians to think of Jesus as this formula. You do the right things, you say the right things, you be at the right places at the right time, and you're saved. Outward things. But building on that, is about as foolish as building on sinking sand. And it's just as devastating as, as Jesus said, right? Not all who say, Lord, Lord, are going to enter the kingdom of heaven. Those who, who hear and don't put it into practice, they're, they're going to fall with a great crash. Jesus doesn't want us to look and sound like his followers. He wants us to truly be his followers in our hearts. He longs for that genuine relationship that he establishes with us. What, would it, what good would it be to be able to preach like Paul, to pile up a, a resume like Moses, and yet in your heart be far away from the one who actually saves, Jesus? So maybe just some examination questions for ourselves. How, how do we do this? Are there ways that we merely talk and act the part? Do we know the right words to condemn the evil around us, but then fail to condemn and repent of the evil in our own hearts? Do we speak the right, pious-sounding words so that people will say, oh, they're Christians, but then forget to connect ourselves to Christ on a daily basis? Are we able to share the promises of Jesus with others 
but then struggle to hold on to the saving power of those promises for ourselves. You see Jesus' warning? You see the danger? But here's the good news of this. Jesus isn't speaking these words to his followers to predict what's going to happen to most of us. No. He's speaking these words to, uh, to prevent that from happening. To, to encourage us, to, to draw us to himself. The only thing Jesus wants to do is to win our hearts over and over again with his faithful love. And that's why he says what he does. He wants us to pay attention to our faith, where our faith is built. He says, the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven, that one will enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, the wind blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. not just about the, the speaking, the hearing, the doing. What is the basis of all that? Doing the Father's will, what is that all about? Jesus explains this in another teaching of his. In John 6, he says, this is my Father's will, that everyone who looks to the Son and believes has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. Do you see the foundation? The doing, the hearing, the speaking, those are important, but on what is it based? On what is it all built? What's the foundation? It's not about wowing others and wowing God with what you do and say. It's about every day being wowed, being overwhelmed by what Jesus does. He says, that is the Father's will. Because what has Jesus done? What does he say? What is the foundation of your faith? It's every day remembering that Jesus lived the perfect life that God requires for you. And, and he clothes you with that. He transfers all of that perfection to you in your baptism. That's how God sees you. It's about every day Remembering that Jesus died on the cross for a reason. Not as an example of love, but to actually pay for your sins so that they're gone. It's as though you never sinned. And that's yours through faith in him. It's about every day remembering that Jesus rose from the dead. That death cannot defeat you. You have life with God right now, and it continues for all of eternity. Jesus forgives you daily. Jesus strengthens you with his promises. Jesus keeps you in his family. He guides you through the good and the bad. It's through the word. When, when that's your foundation, that's when Jesus is building you on the rock. So when anything comes your way, no matter what comes your way, no matter what happens, no matter what others are doing or saying or not doing or saying, your faith will stand because it's based on the foundation of Jesus. So, I may not be a realtor, but I can tell you that your faith is a lot like real estate. What's the most important thing? Location, location, location. When your faith is built on Jesus, his promises, what he says, what he has done for you, everything else follows. That's when you know you're built on the solid rock of Christ, like he just said. Amen. May that peace of God that goes beyond our understanding guard to keep our hearts and our minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let's sing about being built on the rock with our next song.
of Jesus, his, his work, and his word. And one of the ways that we give thanks is with our offering. And so at this time, we remember our offerings. We will not pass a plate right now, but if you did bring a physical offering, you can place that in one of the plates as you exit uh, the sanctuary today. Uh, there are also online opportunities through the QR code or the, or the online link. Uh, this is a way that we are able to not only give thanks to, to Jesus for all he has done for us, but also to be able to continue to spread that good news among ourselves and among our community. So if you are a guest today, we're happy that you're with us, but please do not feel obligated to uh, participate in that. You're welcome to, but please do not feel obligated. At this time, let, let's take an opportunity to connect. If, if you would, please, there, there's a connect card in your service folder. And if you wouldn't mind filling out as much as you're comfortable doing, uh, uh, fill that out. Uh, this is a good way to be able to connect more on a personal level. If you'd like to a visit, you'd like to, to hang out, maybe get a coffee, you want to talk about something, please put that on there. If there's some, some way that I can pray for you this week, uh, please put that on there as well. Uh, during this time, we'll also meditate on, on God's word that we have heard today. Thank you for filling that out, for the opportunity to be able to serve you in a more personal way. At this time, we go to our God in prayer, uh, so I invite any special prayer requests. Uh, I actually have a prayer request real quick, um, if you wouldn't mind joining our family. Uh, this week, my son gets married, and so praying for God to bless the, the wedding day and, the, and their marriage, and then also safe travels for us as we travel to Minnesota. Other prayer requests I saw? Yay. All right. Yes. Your sister's birthday? All right. Remind me her name. What is it? Adelina, that's right. I saw more hands. No? Oh. Okay. I invite you to stand. Almighty and merciful God, we come to you today praising you for uh, the great might that you have worked in us by bringing us to faith in Jesus. Uh, thank you for laying that firm foundation for us through your word uh, and uh, allowing us to be able to trust in that so that no matter what comes in our lives, we can stand in you. We confess that 
so many times it's easy for us to, to look at the outside, to look at the dressing and, and try to um, not only please people, but, but think we can please you with our promises and with our actions. And that's just sinking sand if that's all it is. Help us to base all of our lives, all that we say, think, and do, but especially all that we believe on your, your sure word, your truth, so that everything we do reflects your love for us. Keep us in that firm foundation now and forever. Lord, we, we thank you uh, for the gift of, of, of marriage. Uh, as we look to your son Jesus, we see how you showed faithfulness to us and demonstrated your great love for us. And so hear our prayer for Zach and Maddie and fill their marriage with your abiding grace. Direct their eyes to Jesus and help them to fulfill their marriage vows and remain committed to each other all their days. Teach them the many excellent qualities of your love, that their hearts may overflow with the same qualities to the praise of your name. Lord, we also ask that you would look over uh, my family as we travel to Minnesota for that wedding. Please keep us safe if it is your will and, and bless our time there uh, together with family. Lord, we thank you for the years of grace that you give us on this earth. We especially uh, join uh, Kristen and Michael and Adelina as they celebrate birthdays. Um, not only do we thank you for the, the time that you have given us, but we ask that you would bless the future as well. Um, if it is your will, keep everybody in, in good health so that they may uh, continue to live uh, for you a long life on this earth. We also pray uh, uh, for uh, all the life that you have provided and, and that are unborn right now. Um, we thank you for that miracle of, of life that you uh, knit together in the womb of mothers. Uh, keep all mothers and, and babies safe, and if it is your will, allow them to enjoy the, the, the wonderful uh, blessing of birth and, and the, the life with, with children, uh, but also help them to be able to focus on you and, and the foundation that you give to us through Jesus. And we pray in his name. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. You may be seated for our closing song. Good morning. Again, welcome to everybody. Welcome to special guests that we have with us today. Um, happy to have you. Happy to have everybody here. What an encouragement to our faith to, to be able to worship our Lord together today. A few announcements today. Um, first of all, congratulations to our softball team yesterday. Sounds like we did pretty well. Hopefully everybody's uh, not too sore today. But it sounds like we, we got third place. Huh? It was very good. So 
Thank you for participating in that. I hope you were able to enjoy time with each other and, and time together with fellow Christians playing in that, that softball league. So I'll have pictures this week in the, God willing, I will send that email out this week. I'll have, I'll have uh, pictures in the email. Um, just want to remind everybody, uh, there's another sign up, sh- there's a, still a sign up sheet on the door. If you'd like to be, uh, to go for a hike with our Peace family, uh, that's not this Saturday, but the following Saturday, so the 24th, I believe, of June. And um, there's some confusion with the time, partly by my fault. I, I put 8 o'clock in the, in the email, and so that's what it's going to be, okay? <laughs> so 8 a.m., we'll meet at the, the place. So the sign-up sheet, I believe, says 7.30. I that. Okay, perfect. So 8 a.m., just so if there's any confusion, if that helps anybody to be able to, to come, if you get an extra half hour of sleep, uh, love to have everybody. Um, today we will, will not have any Bible class. Uh, we'll just take some opportunity to enjoy each other's fellowship, uh, each other's company, because today is Cup of Peace, so we have our pop-up uh, latte bar once a month, and today is the day. Uh, we're blessed, blessed to have that. So uh, I'm going to ask. So the first thing, the special drink is? So it's Cup of Sunshine, so it's ice latte mixed with lemonade. Arnold Palmer just got two screens. All right, nice. Smart. Okay. And then if you're down to buy yep. donations. Yep. Yeah, so the donations this month, it's the same as last month. We're still raising money for our two MLC students. So MLC is the college that prepares our future pastors and teachers and staff ministers. And then there's an out all around the country and the world. Um, through MLC, they will match up to $1,200 that we donate per student. So our overall this budget is a little over $2,400. And I think we're at $740 ish right now. Um, so if you can help us reach that goal today, we'd appreciate that. If you've not been to Cup of Peace before, all the drinks are free. So it's all over the shooting for whatever fundraiser you're doing. Yeah. Thank you. Yep, please. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, please. Um, for those of you who don't know, we have a men's group. We meet here every Wednesday at 6.30. Um, we're starting to read through the book of Hebrews. So we read Hebrews uh, 1 last week, and we're going to be reading Hebrews 2 this upcoming Wednesday, and we'll just be going through about a chapter a week. Um, if you all are interested, we'd love to have you guys. And for you guys, we'll talk to you guys. Yeah. 6.30 p.m. clarification. <laughs> thank you. And everyone who's just been reading through the little book wants to thank you, and we have a friend from LC who did so too. Yep. I promise I will get the one who has the recipe and pass it to everybody. Yeah, and take a look at the lookbook. It's uh, it's growing, and it's just a good way to get to know names, associate names and faces, and then you can go up to a, somebody, shake a hand, and and uh, just know them know them better. Yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so again, thanks for, for being here today. Uh, God goes with you uh, today and, and throughout your week. Um, so thankful that, that he builds us through his word and promise, uh, through all of Jesus' actions, he builds us on the firm foundation. May he keep you in that t- this week. Have a great week in your Lord. Hi, I'm Wells President Mark Schrader. Our Synod has adopted the goal of planting 100 new home missions and enhancing 75 existing missions in the next 10 years. 
that effort has already begun. And these new missions are planning their ministries to create opportunities to tell their neighbors about Jesus. Here's one example of a church that's beginning to do just that in Durham, North Carolina. Walking with God all the time through your life is transformative. And if you want to have an impact on the world right around you, there's no better way to do that than sharing Jesus with somebody. This group hasn't yet launched public worship. As they prepare to, they're temporarily worshiping in their pastor's living room. And he says to you today, I forgive you. They were sent to Durham from a Wells church about 20 miles away in Raleigh to explore planting a new church in this growing area. Because of what you have done, Lord, we have nothing to fear. In order to do that, the group has been diligently trying to meet their neighbors and learn how to best reach them with the gospel. My son, who's seven, plays baseball. He plays Little League. And um, we made a very intentional decision to move him from the league that he had played in for three seasons to a league that's based in Durham. And, um, you know, for us, we live very close to communities in both Raleigh and Durham. And so we looked at the situation and we said, this will allow us the opportunity to um, be part of a Durham community and get to know people there better. And as a group, they have been volunteering with various nonprofit groups in Durham to meet the people that they are hoping to reach. We've just been trying to get into the city and just make those connections and just really get to know people in the area um, and, make, and try to make connections off of connections and just network that way to really just learn about the area and what's going to work here. As they come to understand the cultural makeup of their community and what its needs and concerns are, they are able to move into the practical steps necessary in order to launch their ministry publicly. So I would say we're moving along in kind of a logical, actionable sequence of, okay, now we need to have a space so that when we do go out and we invite people, where are we gonna invite them to come to? So, you know, we're starting to go through those steps and then there's just planning conversations happening um, and eventually that's gonna turn into more action. All of this work behind the scenes is happening with their neighbors in mind and how they can best serve the lost souls in Durham. We're just, by nature, we're not good listeners. By nature, we don't want to contextualize. We want them to understand us and, and hear what I'm saying and get into my shoes instead of, I want to walk a mile in yours. I want to understand what it's like to be a 20-year-old African-American growing up in Durham, North Carolina. Or I want to understand what it's like to be a 34-year-old tech woman who moved from Silicon Valley to here because they all got an interesting stories and they all got different perspectives so that when we start talking Jesus we, we can hit them where where they need to hear it. Despite being located in what's traditionally referred to as the Bible Belt, Pastor Lang says that 70 percent of the people in this area are not currently connected to a church. They're not hearing the good news of Jesus. They're not hearing about the hope that they can have. Maybe they just never heard it. Nobody ever told them. Um, but we have an opportunity to do that, to tell them ab about a Savior who loves them, a Savior who died for them. And if we can start to shine lights into the darkness, this place will become a place of light. We want to make decisions not based on the people who are here, but based on the people we're trying to reach for Christ. So in other words, what am I willing to give up? Am I willing to set aside my ego, my pride, my wants, my desires, the way I think a church should be run so that that person might know Jesus better and see their Savior? We ask the Holy Spirit to bless that, and God will bless it as he wills, and we trust that. All that we know is he told us to go, and so we need to go. Wells hopes to plant many other home mission churches over the next 10 years, much like this mission in Durham, that'll uniquely reach their neighbors with the life-saving message of the gospel of Christ. You can learn more about the 100 New Missions in 10 Years effort and how you can get involved at wells110.net.
lips forever and hasten on where thou art gone to be with thee dear Savior draw us to thee Lord lovingly let us depart with gladness that we may be inherit and ever dwell where sin and hell no more can vex our spirit draw us to thee unceasingly 